I am still reeling from my encounter with the man who calls himself victim. His words have sent me right back into the desert again. Or still. I guess I never have had an answer after all. How the sovereignty of God and the free will of man mesh and coordinate or clash and conflict is still a mystery to me. Is there some sort of a formula to predict when the Spirit will speak? I walk a few blocks over and enter a small inn where I find a corner table and brood over a bowl of mutton soup. I guess I'm just not good at discernment. I feel like a batter in baseball who completely guesses where and how fast the pitcher might throw the ball. My reactions are too slow to respond in real time. Sometimes, not all the time, I can tell what just happened as I look in the catcher's mitt and the umpire calls it. But I'm not very helpful to my team this way. I might as well play with my eyes closed. Anyway, no sooner have I broken bread when a brash, filthy man stumbles into the door. Of all places, he chooses to plop down across from me. He has been drinking, though it is not even midday. Why me? Why here? Why now? Could this be some sort of divine appointment? I don't know. I can't tell. I offer him some bread, and he takes it greedily. While he wolfs down my bread and then covets my soup, my mind plays back the scene of when this man burst into the inn. Conversations stopped, and there was a chill in the air. This guy chose to sit with me, not because this was a divine appointment, but because no one else would let him sit near them. I was a stranger, so he came over here. Fresh meat. Anyway, we begin to talk a while. He asks me what I'm doing in town, where I'm from, that sort of thing. I don't tell him much, because I'm not sure why he wants to know, to be honest about it. He's probably looking to see what he can get from me, either by begging or stealing, and I don't want him to have too much personal information. I do flash a moment of boldness, however, and let it slip that I'm a follower of Jesus. This seems to arouse his interest greatly. He asks if I want to hear a story. Three days ago, on the day we know as Good Friday, a man named Jesus is languishing in prison, awaiting his execution at the hand of Pontius Pilate. He is to be crucified between two criminals— the day before, the guards had taken him out and forced him to hew the cross piece for his own cross. He has his last meal and awaits the footsteps to come down the hall to his cell to lead him away to be crucified. Outside, he hears the noise of a crowd yelling something. What was it? Crucify him! Crucify him! We have no king but Caesar! This is going to be worse than he had imagined. The crowd has been stirred into some sort of patriotic frenzy over something. Perhaps he'll be pulled apart by the crowd before he ever gets to the place of the skull. Here are the footsteps. Guards burst in and roughly pull Jesus to his feet, still in chains, and out to the portico. There, for the first time, the man named Jesus Barabbas sees the man Jesus of Nazareth the one they call the Christ. He has been so badly beaten that he is hardly recognizable, but Barabbas knows of his reputation. He has been a bold yet soft-spoken itinerant preacher from up in the north country, but has lately offended the Jewish leaders. How the Roman government got involved in this is anyone's guess. Pilate is asking the crowd a question. Which of these do you want me to release to you? At first, there is little unity, but soon a group of Pharisees are leading a chant that clearly takes over, Release Barabbas! Pilate turns to the Nazarene. He is speaking quietly, but animatedly. At first, Jesus never speaks. And after that, only two short sentences. And Pilate washes his hands and the guards unchain the other Jesus, and that is it. He is a free man. Why had the Nazarene not spoken? 
If the silent Jesus had spoken but one word, he could have been set free, and Barabbas would be hanging on that same cross right now. Instead, silent Jesus is mocked, beaten, dragging the cross, nailed to it, and hanging there. The Jesus who was set free is there to watch every moment of it, and silent Jesus never speaks. When he finally opens his mouth, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They don't know what they do. They don't know what they do. Well, I know what they do. They crucify the wrong man. I led in an insurrection against the Romans and committed murder in the process. So I was to die for it. But this man, if he is a man, has done nothing worthy of death. Hey, silent Jesus, why not speak? Why not curse the mocking crowd? Why not spit back the venom they're spitting at you? Two men named Jesus. One had led a rebellion. The other came to bring unity. One killed a man. The other forgave all men. One went free and the other set all free. Now, he asks, leaning close to me, do you want to guess my name? You are Barabbas? Yes. Now, tell me, what does this mean? I can't live with myself, and I can't figure it out. Why would God do this? I don't know that I have all the answers, friend. But I can tell you this. What happened to you also happened to me. I sinned. He didn't. He died. I didn't. I can't explain it. But I can receive it. It is called grace. We talk for a while longer. We pray together. I think he is getting it. He gets up to leave, thanks me for the bread and the help, and is out the door. So, maybe that was a divine appointment, after all. Curveball, low and inside. <laughs> yes, he was. You and I were set free by the silence of God one good Friday. May we rest in his silence today. Shalom. Irene. Peace.